Well, you know him as your local congressman representing Silicon Valley, including the cities of Cupertino, Santa Clara, and parts of San Jose. What you may not know about Congressman Mike Honda is that he once bore the title of Principal Honda. A former school teacher and a former school board member, Mike Honda has made education his focus in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for being with Thank us, you Mike. For me. Uh, it's great to have you here. I think something that a lot of people don't know about you, and you're very open about this, is that you say you openly struggled through school yourself, that you were not a great student, that you were even having trouble failing some classes. Um, you know, it's surprising when you hear someone of your stature, a congressman, admit to something like that. Well, I, I think it's. Um beneficial for everybody to understand that you know, the reason you go to school is to learn and doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you're uh, you're perfect you know if you're perfect then you, you don't need to go to school my issue was that uh, I grew up speaking Japanese as my first language and by the time I started school I had playground English so everybody right. thought that I had a facility in English but my understanding of classroom instructional English was more difficult. And that I think is really, um, I think that's why you're such an advocate uh, when it comes to English uh, language learners in the schools Correct. and why they have difficulties because you have an inside perspective on what it's like for students like that. And you say we're not really supporting those students as much as you'd like to see them supported. Well, yes, and I think that uh, as teachers we need to um, learn how to um, use the language and use primary language, the first language, as an instructional tool also. Because it's conceptual uh, development and it's, and it's content that's important. And once they get that, no matter what language they speak later on, uh, English, they'll be able to explain and, and be able to be uh, fluent in uh, the information. That's the important thing. All right, I want to talk uh, to you, start off our conversation by talking about this, um, what you call education equity. I know uh, that you have a commission on it and you've really spoken a lot about it and you say there's a big difference between what's education equity and education parity. So explain that for us. Equity and parity, well, right now, in, in, well, in the past, we've been struggling about getting enough money behind each child. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and we tried to increase and equalize the number of uh, dollars behind each child in the state of California. And other states have higher um, numbers, but even if we uh, agreed upon what level of funding we want behind each child, average daily attendance, mm -hmm. it's the same amount of money behind each child. Right. It's equal amounts, but it's not equity. It's parity. And is that because the children aren't at the same level, or maybe don't have the same resources? Sure. It, it, it speaks to the idea that every child is different, unique, therefore needs some needs more help than others, others are more prepared than others, uh, some have other difficulties, uh, learning disabilities, so the education of that child at the beginning would probably be more expensive. You know, need more human resources, more instructional resources. So what would funding, uh, education equity funding look like on practical terms? Well, I think that one of the models that's out there uh, that we already have is we assess a child and we try to understand their strengths and weaknesses, their mm -hmm. peaks and valleys, and then um, put towards that child the resources and the kinds of uh, things that the child needs. And in special education, they do that. They, make, they assess a child and they come up with an individual learning plan. And the individual learning plan will have certain teachers that will bring to that child certain resources and, and help. So are you saying there would be a, spe a different dollar amount for each child spent? And here's my question to you, when we're basically having so much trouble even balancing the books now, the funding sources in California are so disparate in where you get the money, how would we be able to revamp the system to do something so specialized for children? Well, I think if we understand and agree what equity is and mm -hmm. we proceed on that concept, then we'll understand that, you know, the cost of educating a child is different, but we'll also understand that the cost of educating each child to their needs is going to be tremendously expensive. That's when you decide how you want to fund it. Right now we're battling about how much money we're going to give education without understanding how much the children need. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and is an issue of this is that we see different districts a lot of times here, even in Silicon Valley. You sure. can have two different schools, and I know you've talked about this before, that are within just miles of each other, and those schools receive different money. Um, there are some people that would argue, well, you know, wealthier communities are always going to be able to give more money, but you say it goes to a deeper level, at the federal level. Well, I, I think that the question has to be asked, you know, do we have a responsibility for each child, regardless of 
their economic background because even rich children will need a lot of attention if they're if they have uh, disabilities and things like that so and compounding that is um, social economic status and regional differences and I think that one of the uh, entities that's not in the in the debate in the formula is the federal government as equal partners or partners that would say we will take more responsibility in funding each child's needs so that the battle by states balancing their budget becomes minimized. Right now, education becomes a political football every time you have a budget. You know, 85% of California's budget right. is education. What would happen if you minimize that or eliminate you have a partner that came in and says, we're going to be your partner in each child's education and we can come up with a way to work together for the benefit of the children. There are educators in California that would scoff at that and say, we can't even get all the money for uh, special needs kids that the federal government is supposed to give us. We're not getting all the money that we need for Title I kids, for the food programs. How can we expect that the federal government is going to kick in more money when we're not getting even the money that we're entitled to now? Okay, and that speaks to political will, and that speaks to the, the public will also. And when you get those two together and say, this is the mandate, this is what we're going to do for our kids, it's a national security issue. We I didn't, heard we you didn't, say we that not, before. We, what does that mean when you say it's a national security issue? Well, people talk about our performance of our youngsters and how we compare to other countries and that we're going to be left behind. And they yeah, say Because you break it down to two achievement gaps, a domestic achievement gap and an, and, uh, and and an uh, international. international. Right. And I, and I think that, you know, the domestic gap is, is is one that we have to really look at and take responsibility for the education of our own children and not really worry right now about competing with other countries. And here's the thing about other countries. Research says that time on task is critical mm -hmm. in, in instruction and achievement. They spend more time. And they do we it year-round. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we have a cultural and a structural uh, thing that we have to look at and change structural um, how we how we allocate the number of minutes per year for our children cultural we have to get away from agricultural timelines mm -hmm. you know but we're not an agricultural society anymore so the number of minutes and how we look at a school year should be shifted and changed. But do you think that uh, while Americans, uh, he, we as a society, tend to say oh, we want our education to be the best, people don't want to give up that summer vacation, people don't want to give up the ski week, the spring break, do you think we're not committed enough or standing behind what we say we're going to do? It's a choice they, they have to come to grips with. And um, I think that this country is committed to a good education. Um, but then, you know, I guess you're right. The, are they committed enough to spend the resources and time for the schooling of our youngsters? And I think that we fall pretty short. Okay. We have a lot more to talk about. When we come back, we're going to talk about teacher evaluations. We're going to talk about teacher tenure. Lots of hot topics. Stay with us.